Thank you for joining the National Headache Foundation's Depression and Headache Webinar. We are joined this evening by Dr. Robert Schulman of Rush University in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Schulman is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Rush University and a research psychiatrist with the Treatment Research Center at Rush University Medical Center. He also maintains a busy private practice in psychiatry, psychiatric medicine, concentrating on the affective disorders of the various neuropsychiatric illnesses. Dr. Schulman, thank you for joining us. Good evening, all. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the psychiatric aspects of, of uh, headache, pain, and, and depression. This evening's talk will, will basically talk about some of the underlying mechanisms uh, involved in these disorders, these conditions, and how they overlap. And, and how, in fact, we might be able to, to treat these things uh, together. Perhaps an explanation for why it is that um, for those of you who have pain disorders out there and have been tried on antidepressants, it's not because we think that one is depressed with these conditions, although one can be, but that is that they share a lot of underlying uh, essential nervous system mechanisms in the etiology of both pain and depression and therefore the antidepressants which work on depression may also actually have an analgesic effect. Now nowhere are the limitations of uh, our current psychiatric diagnostic scheme is more apparent than the interface between uh, major depressive disorder and indeed all psychiatric disorders and symptoms of chronic pain. In our diagnostic nosology uh, it really doesn't list pain as any symptom of any disorder other than something that's called a pain disorder uh, that has its own diagnosis, but it's not discussed anywhere in the uh, diagnostic criteria for depression or other conditions. Uh, and really, a number of decades of research demonstrate that this segregation of mood and pain really maps poorly onto what we see clinically with our, with our patients. So the comorbidity of depression and pain appears to be more the rule than the exception, uh, with the 30 and up to 60 percent co-occurrence rate in some studies. And evidence suggests that chronic pain and depression do more than co-occur. They can actually promote the development of each other. Uh, and when comorbid, pain and depression mutually amplify each other, contributing significantly to what is treatment resistance in either condition. And in fact, pain has, has been seen as a major obstacle to achieving remission in depression. And when there is a comorbid pain condition, as one is recovering from depression, it is a significant risk factor for relapse. So in fact, they interact with each other, they amplify each other. Each one makes the other harder to treat, it would seem. Uh, there have been a number of, of studies looking at uh, certain pain disorders and depression. Perhaps headache is, is the most commonly, one of the most frequently studied um, uh, co-occurring co conditions. Um, Naomi Breslau uh, did, uh, uh, was part of the, what was called the Detroit Area Study of Headache. And she concluded that um, the migraine major depressive association is unlikely to be a psychological reaction to the demoralizing experience of recurring headaches and suggest shared causes. This explanation is consistent with evidence that similar neurochemical abnormalities might be implicated in both conditions. And we're going to look at some of those things, but first I want to show you a slide. It's a favorite of mine um, because it really demonstrates that the concept of emotional pain uh, that can be expressed physically is not new. This is a portrait that Edgar Degas uh, painted in the late 1860s um, of the woman seemingly doubled over uh, with pain and a, a very painful expression on her face. Um, the title of the portrait is Melancholy. And Sir Henry Maudsley, the founder of modern British psychiatry, once said that the sorrow that has no vent in tears may make other organs weep. And pain and depression seem to be tied together. I think it's a nice example of that. Um, so what is it about 
these things that get tied together? Well, there seems to be a shared neurochemical link. And what we see is that dysregulation of certain uh, pathways with the what are called monoamines, the neurotransmitter serotonin and norepinephrine are strongly associated with depression, but they are both key modulatory neurotransmitters. They're both very important neuro brain chemicals involved in regulating the perception of pain as well as uh, lighting up a certain part of the brain that um, is involved with dampening down um, uh, information from the periphery. In the picture over here to the left of the screen, if you have that up on your computers and you can see this, uh, there's the individual with uh, the blue and the white sort of circuitry. Those are uh, my colors. Those are the serotonin and norepinephrine pathways. Uh, the area in the cortex is where pain is perceived and if you have abnormalities in this circuitry it can change the way that people perceive pain or attach emotions to pain. Conversely, serotonin and norepinephrine are involved in these descending pathways. These descending pathways will in turn light up, um, it will stimulate certain areas of the spinal cord, They're actually called the dorsal lateral, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, no, I'm forgetting where it is. Anyway, the ascending pain fibers are in the lamina of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They're sort of on top and to the periphery. And that's where uh, pain transmission from uh, uh, the rest of the body travels up the spinal cord and heads into the central nervous system to the brain to be processed. And um, alongside of these ascending pain fibers are opiate receptors. What happens is, is that when you have intact serotonin and norepinephrine descending uh, circuits, uh, those pathways can in turn light up the opiate receptors which will in turn dampen down the information coming from the periphery. So it's, it's an analgesic approach which is an explanation for why perhaps some of the, the um, um, dual acting serotonin and norepinephrine um, antidepressants can have a, um, an analgesic effect far earlier and at far lower doses than one would expect if one were treating depression. So I hope that was clear to folks. And balances of both serotonin and norepinephrine may indeed explain the presence of the emotional and physical symptoms of depression, as well as a heightened perception of pain. This next slide illustrates that it probably goes beyond coexistence, that there are complex neurobiological underpinnings of mood and uh, disorders and pain, that when you have either stress or injury acting upon a genetic vulnerability, any number of things can happen. You can get uh, dysregulation of neuronal circuitry. That's a network level uh, malfunctioning. Uh, you can also get auto, uh, autoimmune responses, autoimmune dysregulation, uh, neuroendocrine uh, responses, as well as changes at the level uh, of within the cell uh, resulting in the neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with depression as well as the manifestations of pain. Uh, my, my talk to physicians, uh, by the way, uh, this information comes out of our, our continuing medical educational talks to physicians and, and, and at those conferences we will delve into some of the neuronal circuitry dysregulation as well as the autoimmune stuff and what happens at the level of the cell. It, it's you know, pretty scientific. A lot of the information is, is really uh, done at, at, at um, university level um, laboratory research stuff that's pretty technical. So we didn't include it here, but just this next slide tells you a little bit about some of the, the dysfunctions that it can occur. Um, we're talking now about the monoamines. 5-HT stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin, NE, represents norepinephrine, and DA represents dopamine. These are the three main monoamines or, or brain neurotransmitters that are involved with most of our regulation of mood uh, conditions, but also uh, regulation of perception of pain and modulation of pain. So they're long held to be responsible for depressive illness, but 
while we have a lot of medicines that work on these conditions, these, these monoamines, they don't cure everybody. They don't fix everybody. And there's treatment resistance. So chances are that while these monoamines, these neurotransmitters, are primarily responsible for most of the um, mood dysfunctions and pain dysfunctions we see, it doesn't tell the whole story that there are perhaps other um, things happening in the central nervous system that may account certainly for our treatment resistance. Uh, patients and such. We know that there are psychological functions associated with each neurotransmitters. Those associated with serotonin include mood, anxiety, arousal, ability to, to be vigilant, um, control of impulsivity, control of aggression, suicidality is felt to be a, a function of, or suicidality is felt to be a dysfunction or dysfunctional serotonin circuits uh, seems to be sort of managed through the serotonin system. Cognition, control of intrusive thought, those functions, psychological functions involving norepinephrine and dopamine, which are actually very similar uh, molecules, include attention, concentration, working memory, the ability to process information. Also, motor movement, the ability to overcome inertia and set movement into action, motivation, uh, mood as well as and energy. Uh, dopamine is pretty much the same as norepinephrine, but you can also add in the notion of feeling pleasure, um, high interest, sexual functioning is felt to be much more modulated by dopamine. It's that pleasure reward kind of system uh, seems to be a dopaminergic function. Now, interestingly, for many years people would come in and and um, you know, we use the notion of a chemical imbalance to, to um, describe what the depression is all about. Well, interestingly enough, when you look at the side effects of the serotonergic medicines, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, when you look at the long-term side effects, they include being sleepy, uh, metabolic slowing, some sexual dysfunction, apathy, a sense of fatigue or asthenia memory issues and such, they, that looks suspiciously like when patients have dis, a deficiency in their dopamine and norepinephrine circuitry, you can almost start collecting the lines, memory functioning concentration with mem impaired attention, problems concentrating, uh, depressed mood, the slow data processing as well, uh, being low interest with apathy, sexual dysfunction and such, fatigue and asthenia. So, what is it about the SSRIs? Are they just not fully treating the depression or do they create another set of problems? And um, it's for the folks to figure out maybe they need less of an SSRI, maybe they need something to balance out in terms of uh, upping levels of dopamine and norepinephrine. This is one of the uh, findings that we get with uh, long-term using of these medications. So what is it about major depressive disorder that is also seen and chronic pain patients. You know, what, what, what's the relationship between the two that we see uh, in patients? Well, there are certain commonly shared symptoms, including changes in appetite, weight changes, loss of energy, uh, uh, physical slowing. Uh, patients complain of marked sleep disturbance and have difficulty with focus and concentration. And the predictors of depression in the chronic pain patient um, the most significant uh, predictors of depression include the frequency that uh, severe pain is experienced, the functional disability, the number of painful areas on the body, the intensity of the pain, and there are certain psychological factors such as poor coping styles, uh, problem, poor difficulty solving problems, maybe low self-esteem are also predictors of depression. So what psychiatric conditions do we see in pain patients? Well, we've talked a lot about depression, but we really can see any number of psychiatric conditions. I think depression, because of this, perhaps the sh shared circuitry is, is maybe the, among the most common, but we see other things as well. Pain patients can experience the bipolar disorders. They may get into substance use disorders as well, perhaps independent of their pain or perhaps in response to their pain conditions. We certainly see anxiety disorders. There were studies looking at the longitudinal course of the migraine patients showing that um, a number of them had 
uh, an anxiety condition prior to the onset of headache with the development of depression subsequent to uh, years of having um, uh, recurring headaches. So that, that was a study that uh, Manzanini came out of Italy in the, in the late 90s. Uh, there are the somatoform disorders. Um, those are the, the kind of the brain-body conditions, um, uh, bowel disorders, fatigue syndromes and such, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder as, as um, seen in greater numbers of chronic pain patients, uh, those who had uh, traumatic life events or history of abuse as a child, there's a greater representation in our chronic pain patients than there is in the general population. It's important to be able to distinguish between depression, whether it's the unipolar variety or perhaps a bipolar uh, condition. The reason being is because it really affects your choice of treatment, very much so because antidepressants can sometimes exacerbate or worsen um, the longitudinal course of the bipolar patient such that they have more accelerated cycles and more recurring illness um, than they would have perhaps even untreated. Um, and the keys are that uh, the unipolar depressed patient is often very anxious, uh, f physical complaints, irritable, angry. They have a lot of emotionality. And the bipolar patient sometimes appears a little bit differently. They may sleep too much instead of too little. Um, they tend to be more flat and empty, more uh, motorically slowed down. Uh, generally occurs first episode at a younger age of onset than unipolar depression. And we see uh, more suicide attempts perhaps in the bipolar population, more evidence of psychotic features. Uh, often the onset is in the uh, postpartum period. So a young woman with a postpartum depression, sometimes it is suspicious for a possible bipolar process. Kurt Kroenke in the archives of family medicine a number of years ago, we used to go into um, family medicine clinics and uh, do questionnaires of people presenting with uh, certain conditions. And what he saw is that there's a high representation of um, anxiety disorders and depressive disorders in patients presenting with different pain conditions. We'll take headache as an example. Uh, a third of patients presenting to uh, primary care with this complaint of headache. Of those uh, third of patients, 36% of patients, 28% of those had a comorbid anxiety disorder, while up to 40% of those people presenting with headache had um, a mood disorder, most likely depressive disorder. So that brings us to the issue of the medications. And, and you know, we talked about the shared underlying pathways and, and shared mechanisms uh, um, between um, pain and mood in terms of the neurotransmitters in the somatosensory cortex and such. Uh, and what we find is that preclinical and clinical data suggest the tricyclic antidepressants, venlafaxine, uh, which is also known as Effexor, duloxetine, known as Cymbalta, mirtazapine, which is branded as Remeron, can modulate pain. Now all these antidepressants are dual acting, that they inhibit the reuptake or otherwise increase levels of both serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, the evidence regarding the um, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors really are conflicting. In open studies, they do well, but in really controlled studies, they, they don't do as well. Um, and the antidepressants appear to have an analgesic effect independent of any effect on mood to show efficacy at lower doses than it would be if we were treating depression and induce analgesia faster than mood elevating effects. Now I make this statement and there are names of medicines on here. Um, I'm not promoting, let me, let me give this disclaimer, I'm not promoting any product over another. I'm not saying anything um, uh, should be tried in, in that regard, but these are medicines that actually have data to su that suggests that they can be used. Um, and again, understanding our, our mechanistic reasons why we can understand why that may be. We'll get into a slide a little bit later about all the approved and non-approved uses of some of these medications. How do the tricyclics work? Well, they block the uptake of serotonin and norepinephrine so that they remain in the space between cells longer and can do their work. They kind of work at recharging the cell. They also enhance 
um, the descending inhibition that we slowed, showed early on in the slide, how the picture of the spinal cord that they go down and they, they sort of light up the opiate receptors alongside the ascending pain fibers and can produce some analgesia back. Uh, that way, and they also have an antagonistic on um, what's called the NMDA receptor, the N-methyl diaspartate receptor, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And by uh, kind of antagonizing it by turning off the excitation, it can sort of suppress the the cortical spread of depression seen in in the migraine patient. It can also diminish the the sort of chronic activation of certain things, certain signals that um, impact the perception of pain. Now, folks who are in tune to this may have heard of this NMDA receptor. There are other studies going on in the use of ketamine, which is a, an, um, anesthes is an agent used by the anesthesiologist in the hospital to produce um, anesthesia and, and uh, hypoalgesia in patients um, during surgical procedures. Um, some of the pain docs are doing it for certain pain conditions, and it is being looked at as a, a sort of an emergency kind of treatment for severe depressive disorder. It's a short-lived response when you get a response to the agent. And what the ketamine does, it actually antagonizes this NMDA receptor. So folks will be hearing a lot more discussion about this receptor uh, in the literature very, very soon. If, it's, it's already there, uh, but it'll probably be out even more so. So what are the antidepressants? We have the traditional mechanisms, the tricyclic antidepressants, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are uh, the, the, the older class of medicines. These are the medicines I grew up with as a young doctor. And then we moved into the newer medicines, starting with fluoxetine, the first uh, SSRI that was released, um, of which there are now six of them on the market. There's the velacidone, the last, the newest antidepressant, which combines this serotonin reuptake inhibition with a, with a partial agonism of an upstream receptor that actually helps produce more serotonin out of the cell. We have bupropion, which works on dopamine and norepinephrine. We have the dual acting agents, similar to the tricyclics, which are the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, venlafaxine, duloxetine. Uh, milnasopran, which is known as Civella, is only on the market in the United States for the treatment of fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain disorders related to diabetes, I believe, it, are its indications. And the old desmethylvenlafaxine, which is a metabolite of the uh, venlafaxine. This stands for, the SERI is serotonin and, uh, I'm sorry, serotonin agonist with reuptake inhibition. That's the phazidone, used to be called serzone, as well as trazodone. The NASA drug, the space drug, well, it's, it's a norepinephrine and serotonin, serotonin uh, antidepressant. It works by some totally novel mechanisms. That's mirtazapine. And then we have the straightforward norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, other than disipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, and protriptyline, they're both no, um, straight pretty much norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. We have the atomoxetine, also known as Stratera, only on the market in the U.S. for attention deficit disorder, but it does have this norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. And riboxetine, which is was uh, studied and proposed, went to the FDA, but did not uh, was not approved for use in the United States. Other uses of the antidepressants, approved uses, include these are mostly the uh, serotonergic medicines, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is classified as an anxiety disorder in our diagnostic nos nosology. We have the uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, as well as nicotine dependence, which is bupropionate, which is a dopaminergic medication. Also approved are the use of medicines in the diabetic neuropathy and fibromyalgia, including the duloxetine and the milnasopran, which is not approved for depression, but for fibromyalgia. And then we have other commonly used but not approved uses in eating disorders, impulse discontrol, GI effects, and autism, uh, pain disorders, and such. How does the psychiatrist approach the pain patient, and uh, what is our approach to chronic pain and headache? Well, our goal is to improve the patient's functional status, ability to perform their activities of daily living. 
without significant uh, pain-related interruption or dysfunction. We always assess for comorbidity issues and substance misuse issues as well and try and design our treatments with appropriate agents that will not make another condition worse and hopefully make as many conditions better with, with the simplest means possible. You know, one medicine is better than two, two medicines is better than three, and uh, so you want to knock off as many points on the line as you can, uh, as best you can. Additionally, we provide the supportive psychotherapy regarding coping styles, learned behavior, issues of stress, and such. So to summarize our discussion, major depression and pain may share a genetic underpinning involving brain circuitry that modulates pain, emotional tone, and the stress response. There are multiple uh, layers of this, of neuroendocrine, autonomic, immune, and cellular dysfunctions that are shared in these disorders. And over time, these conditions kidno progress to reflecting neuroplastic changes or what's called central or neurosensitization, and this is when the condition becomes more chronic and difficult to treat because the brain is in a pattern of, of behaving a certain way, and our treatments are really to get the goal, uh, get the central nervous system to forget these circuits and forget these molecular memories, the central sensitization, and it really seems to be an, a good strategy for uh, both depression and various chronic inflammatory and neuropathic pain conditions. And that's our presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulman. Our first question comes from Kimberly. What is the best alternative for an individual that cannot take SSRIs or SNRIs? What is the best alternative? Re what is the best? Well, you know, depending on what you're treating, or if you're treating pain or, or if you're treating depression. I mean, there are a lot of other... Um, sort of medicines with alternative mechanisms of action to treat pain uh, conditions that are not antidepressants. If somebody cannot tolerate either an SSRI or an SNRI, my suspicion is that they're highly sensitive to the uh, serotonergic component of the medication and there are a number of things that one can do to try and balance that out. If somebody is treating depression, um, you know, we in my own way of thinking, there are different types of depression. Not all depressions are, are made equal. There are the very anxious depressions that can't sleep. They're, they're overwhelmed with worry and concern, uh, panic and fear. Um, and then there are the, the other kinds of depression which are less anxious but more flat and empty, a sense of depletion. And if for the depleted kinds of depression, we think about repleting the individual with more of the noradrenergic or dopaminergic antidepressants. Uh, these include the bupropion. Um, they include uh, a low dose of, uh, or, or mirtazapine sometimes can work. Side effects with that too. I mean, every medicine has side effects, unfortunately. Sometimes we'll use psychostimulants. Sometimes we'll use this, what's called the selegiline patch, which is, um, uh, the, the trade name is, is MSAM. It's, a, it's using an old Parkinson's medicine that has an MAOI, a monoamine oxidase inhibiting mechanism, but not like the traditional ones. You're allowed to have fava beans and a little Chianti with this, with this medication within reason, so much less restrictive, and it can be very activating. So for those who are flat and empty who need activation, you want to consider agents that are going to be more activating, like with have the nor epinephrine and dopaminergic kind of effects. If you have a really highly anxious um, depressive thing and you're thinking in terms of, well, you need some serotonergic stuff, but it's difficult to tolerate, there are ways of, of kind of doing that. There are certain medicines that actually come in a liquid form and you can give you know, a tenth of what the smallest size tablet is and you can you can actually get people to um, become more tolerant to the medication over time and eventually adjust doses upward. It just takes a lot of time and patience on everybody's part, but it can be done. Um, so there are always things to do for depression, um, utilizing the antidepressants. If you have to step outside the antidepressant box, um, there are other medications that have been studied in depression um, that are on the market that are more in the the second generation antipsychotic class or the mood stabilizer class. 
uh, and such. Um, you always want to make sure that there are no other additional medical causes, that it's not a side effect to other medications or not a, another metabolic or autoimmune process that, that's occurring with thyroid or other things that are affecting functions of the brain. Um, if you can't tolerate medicines, cognitive psychotherapy, cognitive therapy uh, has been shown to be helpful uh, in depressive disorders as much as any one of the medicines might be. There have been several studies looking at that. That's also an option. Our next question comes from Deborah. Does it make sense that my migraines and depression respond to the older antidepressants such as Zoloft rather than the new um, medications such as Pristique? Well, does it make sense? It makes sense in that everybody has their own individual chemistry. And Zoloft, interestingly, is, is just a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It doesn't have the noradrenergic effects. Pristique has some of the noradrenergic effects. You know, just based on data alone, you'd think, you know, the, the latter might be more effective than the former, but everybody's different and, and tolerates molecules um, in different ways. So does it make sense? And that everybody is different? Yeah, of course it makes sense. I think your next question is from Carol. I've had chronic migraine for the last 12 years, and I was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. And I'm currently taking Cinemat, with, which helps with replacement of dopamine. Would that help with migraine pain or depression? You know, it's interesting. I saw somebody yesterday who has been seeing a number of my colleagues for a number of years in the family. Um, actually, the daughter uh, I have to admit, saw me on television one time, and, and, and so she made an appointment, and she brings her, her dad in, and I'm looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, this, this fellow has Parkinson's disease, um, which is why the ECT helped temporarily, but he keeps slipping, and he has low energy, and he always feels like he's fatigued, and he's moving through molasses. So I kind of had to break the news to him and kind of maybe send him back. The fact of the matter is, is that, um, well, the short answer is yes. In fact, the, the Parkinson's medicines actually can help depression quite a bit. And that we actually use them to augment uh, our treatment of antidepressants. Sometimes when you're using the serotonergic medicines and you, and you get a partial response and you want to get the rest of the person better, you know, and, and sometimes we use psychostimulants. My, my mentor, uh, Jan Fawcett, used to be the chairman at Rush. She's now down in New Mexico. Uh, Dr. Fawcett always used to remind us, don't forget your dopamine. And, and in recent years, he's been using low doses of either Cinemit or Mirapex uh, or Requip or some of the other uh, direct dopamine agonists used in to treat Parkinson's disease as augmentation treatment in depressive disorders. So, so it can be very likely it could help. I think that that the Parkinson's patient, Carol, can can feel anxious because they can't move. They can get get depressed. The depression, I think, is not just a demoralization associated with having an illness. I think that there are that there are certain circuits that that don't do well, and again, Parkinson's is a is a diminishment of dopamine in certain parts of the brain, and and dopamine is correlated with our mood circuitry. So by replacing, by enhancing the dopamine circuits, I think you have a tremendous benefit on depression. Now, will it help headache? It's a good question. Uh, it really depends on on what kind of um, sequencing you go through with the onset of headache and what circuits are, are necessarily involved with your kind of headache, um, I think you'll find out. I think that you know most migraineurs go through patches where headaches are bad and they can come out of it. My wife's a migraineur. She gets very difficult times, you know, transitional seasons, whenever the sun's crossing the equator. So spring and fall are her difficult times, and she can get into into uh, a much greater frequency of headaches and things like that. We've actually used, um, because she never tolerated the serotonergic agents or the anti-epileptic kinds of things, either to pyramid or, or divoproex, um, that we've actually used bupropion, which is a dopaminergic agent, much like the, the Parkinson's medicines are going to be working on dopamine circuits. And those were very helpful 
for her. So there's a good chance that it could be helpful. You'll have to see. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris. How do we best avoid serotonin syndrome when trying to treat these comorbidities with medication? Okay. Uh, serotonin syndrome is, a, is, just for everyone online, is a condition where there is essentially a serotonin excess that is usually caused by combining uh, medications that might have similar mechanisms of action. And, and so um, each medicine that has a serotonin reuptake inhibition, they don't inhibit the, the reuptake mechanism fully, it's usually anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. Well, if you had a second medicine that may have a similar thing, they may get the rest of the, the uh, reuptake uh, um, pump uh, sites, and therefore you, you can't recycle your serotonin, and you can get too much, and that gives you a, a real uncomfortable feeling, and pressure's up, you feel jittery, you feel sickish. Uh, your heart rate goes up, your autonomic nervous system is affected by it, and it's very, very painful. So how can you avoid it? You know, it actually doesn't happen that frequently. It is postulated that, um, that the triptans, which uh, have an effect on uh, the serotonin 5-HT1, B, and D uh, receptor sites in combination with serotonergic antidepressant serotonin reuptake inhibitors can cause a serotonin syndrome. It's been reported. Um, it's it's in the books. Uh, uh, you know the pharmacists will always question it. If there's a if there's a um, a patient who's on both, will call the doctor up. But but what we see in clinical practice is don't see it that often, and it's actually pretty rare. I've actually in my 20s, you know, since Prozac came out in late January 1988, <laughs> and um, I've only seen it a, really a handful of times out of the, the you know, thousands and thousands of patients that we've seen on it. So I think that um, I think that you just have to be careful. I think uh, tramadol and serotonin reuptake inhibitors are a risk. I think the, the triptans and the SSRIs are a risk combining. Um, certain antidepressant, different antidepressants can cause a risk. I think that, that you just have to be aware of it and if you get the feeling of, of, uh, of, of pressure, heart rate up and down, your jitteriness, uh, feeling sickish, flu-like, um, off your game, dizzy, lightheaded, just, just really like you just drank you know, uh, two pots of coffee, um, then then get yourself somewhere to an immediate care uh, place uh, so that that um, you know things can be managed. It goes away. It's rarely life-threatening. It really does go away. And you just avoid it by knowing your medications. I really advise people. I when I sit with patients, I ask, "Do you have questions?" You know, do you? Do you I, I like to to describe the medicines. I show pictures of medicines. If somebody can't tell me what dose, I'll find a picture and say, okay, what color is it? And tell me so we know, understand what size it is. I do my best to educate people about their medicines. I write out a list every time so, so they have the names and the doses and the times in front of them. I encourage people to really know their medicines and to study up. I, I love an informed consumer. I think it's up to the individual to to understand what medicines they're taking and what the risks are, and you are always allowed to ask if your if your provider doesn't like questions, you know, unless you're really wedded to the person. You know, I would I would consider you know if this is the person for you. I think that that the, a good provider takes all questions, encourages questions, and, and I think it's always fair to ask, will this interfere with any of my medicines? Is there a risk of any drug interaction? Doctor, I, I know this is what you want to give me. These are my other medicines. Make sure the doctor knows everything that you take um, so that they can make the best judgment. And you're always allowed to look it up. There are some wonderful apps and programs that are available to the general public that you can look up drug interactions. And, and if you have concern, you know, you'll 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 let whoever gave you the prescription know you have a concern and just ask for reassurance. Is it safe? Do you really want me to do this? And such. So I hope that answers the question, Chris. 
Uh, Ray would like you to kindly discuss the relationships between chronic head pain and early onset Parkinsonism. I don't necessarily know of any relationship between uh, chronic head pain and the development of, of Parkinson's disease. I think that um, there are certain medicines that can cause people to experience Parkinsonism. Um, certainly the, uh, the antipsychotics, even the second generation antipsychotics that are more commonly used these days for any number of conditions can cause a Parkinsonism. The antidepressants can also uh, produce what appears to be a, a Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is the appearance of, of symptoms. They're usually associated with Parkinson's disease, but it's not due to the uh, it's it's not due to the, the, the idiopathic condition. It's it's it, they're secondary conditions, secondary to something else. In these cases, secondary to use of medication. So. Um, I would probably, if that person were to walk into my office and I would do a thorough, you know, exam, I would I would look at all the medications that that somebody is taking. I would screen for other kind of uh, disorders. Um, I would be curious to know the age of the individual because if it's a a young age, I would really suspect that it certainly wasn't Parkinson's; that it was, it, that it would be a secondary appearance. And if it was somebody who was older, then I think it's somebody that we just have to watch. But as far as I know, there's there's no direct correlation between um, any of the the head pain conditions or atypical facial pain conditions um, and Parkinson's disease. And most Parkinson's patients don't necessarily. Um, at least in my experience, um, uh, present uh, with pain. It's much more likely, I think, to present with depression at least. But then maybe I'm seeing a skewed population given my, my profession, my specialty. So I hope that answers the question. I, I, I haven't seen the connection between the two. Uh, but if somebody were to present, I would be very thorough in looking at, at their medications and other, other contributing factors. Our next question is from Deborah. Can you address how to minimize or even treat neurosensitization? Okay, again, for, for everybody, the neurosensitization or sensual sensitization is where, you can think of it this way. Um, think of the Grand Canyon. Think of all those years that, that water running down the side of a mountain with every rainfall goes to the lowest lying um, areas, gravity pulls it down. And through the years it creates divots and, and those waterways are are maintained and it's very hard to to take something that is, is so well established, sort of a, a, a groove and then change the water to flow a different way. That's what the neurosensitization or sensual sensitization is where you sort of created these these um, neuronal tracks, if you will, that are sending messages along these these tracks and they get ingrained. It's like they get, you know, to use, you know, a, a, a metaphor, they get burned in uh, that way and, and so they continue to function long after um, the whatever the tissue injury was has passed. And so we think it's an explanation for chronic pain that develops like after an injury, like reflex uh, sympathetic pain conditions, thalamic pain syndromes and such, uh, because it's really the area of the brain that perceives the pain that, that's really dysfunctional at that point. Um, so the way to go about doing it is to figure out, well, what, what pathways are involved, what, 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 what neurotransmitters are involved, what mechanisms are involved, and the antidepressants are a way of going about it, trying to diminish the firing of, of certain cells with um, medicines like uh, pregabalin, Lyrica, Neurontin, Gabapentin, uh, the other uh, topiramate, the other anti-epileptic drugs that have been studied in pain conditions. Tegretol used to be used for, carbamazepine used to use, use the treatment for atypical or trigeminal uh, pain disorders trigeminal neuralgia and such, um, is a way of stabilizing the cells and trying to stop the firing, trying to, to 
to put a, a block into the gully where the water's running and divert it somewhere else and out of that 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 rut so the rut sort of kind of fills in and heals up um, ketamine is being used in certain pain centers much as we discussed earlier it's it's a it's a the NMDA receptor antagonists and there are a couple of them out there there's a Lou Gehrig's disease and ALS medicine that affects um, um, an MDA receptors. Uh, there's a memory medicine, an Alzheimer's medicine. It's called Memantine, um, is the generic name. Uh, Nemenda is the brand name. That is a very low-level an MDA receptor uh, antagonist. Uh, these things have been looked at in pain conditions uh, as well. Again, it's a way of breaking that sort of chronic uh, neurosensitization by by blocking. The, the, the kind of pathways involved uh, with this stuff. Uh, they're looking at, at medicines that will um, uh, deactivate. There are certain cells in the central nervous system they're called microglia. They're actually support cells for, for the major neurons, but they seem to get very they seem to get very activated in, in con conditions of chronic stress, including chronic pain, depression and such. They're looking at ways of deactivating it. There's been some studies using a, a tetracycline-based antibiotic, minocycline, uh, that seems to deactivate the glial cells. You know, again, this stuff is just in research. There have been a few reports. The times that I try these things, they don't work. But you know, these are tough patients, and I don't, you know, I'm just sort of shooting from the hip and and folks. But it's being looked at, it's being studied, it's being understood better than it ever was as to what the dysfunctions are at, at even the level of the cell and subcellular components uh, with the central sensitization uh, conditions, looking for ways to interfere to block it. So really the goal is, is, to, is to somehow or another turn the circuits off that account for, for the, uh, um, the persisting perception of pain or, or other things. How do you turn those circuits off? Boy, if I had an answer to that, I mean, I, I could market it. <laughs> I could retire. But, you know, we, we don't have the answer. Again, everybody is different. Everybody's chemistry is different. And it really just takes a lot of, a lot of work at finding what's going to work for that, that individual. I hope that answers the question. Our next question comes from Mary. How long should you stay on a medicine like MAIOs to see if it will work? Well, you want if you're treating depression, um, the rule of thumb used to be four to six weeks, or even longer. Now you got to make sure that somebody's at a therapeutic dose of a medication. The the really the the wonderful thing that happened in 1988 when fluoxetine Prozac came out is that you could start with a therapeutic dose and and leave people on it, you know, forever because the side effects were were so mild in comparison to tricyclic antidepressants and MAO inhibitors. Um, depending on what the MAO inhibitor is, you want to make sure that it's at a therapeutic dose uh, for a sufficient period of time. In my own practice, I personally think that we don't wait four to six weeks, um, that we usually see if we get somebody up to a therapeutic dose, we should see something within within you know two to three weeks. If I see a little benefit, I will try and push it more to optimize it, and give it more time. You know, just as a rule of thumb, just as a stylistic thing, if I see somebody, uh, a new patient, or we're changing a medicine, I try and see them back in about three weeks with one communication at, at about 10 days so that we have a good eye on what's going on so that at that, you know, approximately three week time frame, I can make decisions about dosing or about augmentation or about changing. So I don't wait four to six weeks. I like to work a little bit quickly because I feel that people are suffering and they deserve to be as treated as optimally as possible. But often you just have to be patient. You've got to make sure that you get up to a therapeutic dose and give it some time. There are studies that suggest that people who respond a little bit if they're continuing on their medicine over a period of time, uh, respond later on. Usually in studies for depression, they are six-week studies, eight-week studies. Some will be carried out 12 weeks, but that is rare. 
in this day and age. When you look at some of the older information, this is data back from the 90s, where we looked at the long-term use of sertraline and disipramine. It was a head-to-head -head study that Pfizer done with Zoloft and what used to be called norpramine or disipramine, a tricyclic antidepressant. And what we saw is that is that a certain number of people, you know, they, they really treated for a year. And those who didn't necessarily get you know, were not considered responders at the end of 12 weeks. They were still continued on their medicine. But over the next several months, they became responders. They actually eventually got better um, on the same medicine. You know, was it time or was it the medication? Our assumption was is that the medication actually had some input. So, you know, when we're treating acute illness, we like to see, you know, people moving faster. I do. I don't wait around. I don't want to give everybody three to six months on one medicine. I just don't think that's that's useful. People are suffering. I think I can work faster than that. The fact of the matter is sometimes it does take that long for certain individuals. So I'm, I'm hedging my answer to you. Um, I don't usually wait four to six weeks. I tend to work quicker, but there is data that suggests that if you just stick with something long enough, eventually it may kick in. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lori. Once a migraine is starting to end, is it normal to experience depression? Well, I don't know if you have Lori on the line or if you're taking these written down, but I would ask the question, um, was, is it just a, an acute feeling of dysphoria, of a, of a depressive feeling, or is it something left to itself that will be sustained for several days or weeks? But what I would say is that at the end of a migraine, if there is a sense of dysphoria, uh, it may be related to some of the treatments for migraine, some of the opiates actually when you take and then they wear off, there can be a sense of dysphoria. Um, or it could be just a consequence of what's happening in the CNS um, uh, that, that there's this. If it is persisting and problematic, I, I had a patient who, who the day before her period, her menstrual period, she would be acutely suicidal. Well, you know, it's one or two days out of the month, but, you know, that's a bad day, and you don't want bad things to happen, and so we ended up, you know, treating it. If this is, if the headaches are frequent enough, and there's enough dysfunction from the dysphoria or depressive component that, that occurs at the end of the headaches, and the headaches are frequent enough that it's occurring frequent enough in and of itself, I would say it probably warrants treatment. And, you know, whenever you have a pain condition like headache, you look for the psychiatric comorbidity. If it's a panic disorder, you want to think about things for, for that can address the anxiety or the, the, the circuitry and panic disorder. If it's, if it's depression, you want to really consider if an antidepressant would be a useful thing to try and both work as a headache preventative, a prophylaxis against headache, and also to protect against the depressive swing subsequent to the headache. That would make sense to me. All right. It looks like that I was that the Lori's question. last question that we could address for the evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulman, for joining us. Um, we'll definitely have to repeat the session if you uh, would allow. We have several questions I, I still left. I would be happy to, and I, I want to say this. There are some very good questions. I, I really am... am was very impressed and, and I'm glad folks took the interest to, to listen and and I hope we provided some some useful content for you this evening and that you learned something it's you know the reason I like to do this is because I think you know it's good when people learn things about themselves and about their loved ones and and they they become informed consumers and make better decisions about their lives and their care so I I'm glad everybody listened in I appreciate it thank you Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um